fifth edition of the Z Jaipur Literature Festival in association with Nexa at Charbagh. We are delighted to introduce session 57, The Black Dwarves of the Good Little Bay. We request you to kindly turn your phones on silent mode and please join me in welcoming writer and lawyer Warren Thomas Matthew, whose first novel, The Black Dwarves of the Good Little Bay, is the one that's up for discussion today. He'll be in conversation with Devapriya Roy, author of three novels, The Wig Women's Handbook, The Weight Loss Club, and the most recently, Friends from College. The book would be launched by third term member of parliament from Thiruvanthapuram and best-selling author of 20 fiction and non-fiction books, Dr. Shashi Tharoor, recipient of the Pravasi Bharatiya Samman, Crossford Lifetime Achievement Award, and many more for his remarkable contributions to the literary world. Dr. Tharoor would unveil the book. Let's welcome the panel on stage with a huge round of applause. And we request Dr. Tharoor to kindly unveil the book. Request Dev Priya and Varunji to also accompany him. This actually is, is a bit of a surprise for all of you, including me, <laughs> because uh, it was actually my friend and fellow parliamentarian, Mohua Moitra, who was supposed to launch The Black Dwarves of the Good Little Bay by Warren Thomas Matthew. But since she was called away for an urgent meeting, she asked if I would step in. And I have to confess, therefore, I'm launching a book I haven't read, but I've heard some really exciting things about. Many of you may have seen a wonderful review in Outlook magazine that um, describes the sort of dystopian, dystopian Mumbai or post-Mumbai world in which everybody is living in something called the Bombodrome, a looming structure uh, holding the millions of Mumbai with every futuristic comfort, tech-driven lives, uh, synthetic vegetation, and of course, finally censored conversations. And that dystopia, uh, described with a great deal of sympathy, uh, and at the same time challenged in the book is um, Varun Thomas Matthews' uh, invention. It's an idea that people, even in this kind of technocratic future, would be driven to rebel. And uh, he has uh, a civil servant, India's last remaining civil servant, uh, by the very deliberately chosen name of Godse, uh, who is the one who starts um, the Black Dwarves of the Good Little Bay. Uh, Black Dwarf, of course, is a reference to um, the, uh, I'm trying to find the exact descriptions, I don't. Uh, these are the stellar remnants that cannot emit heat and light in astronomy, but still make their presence felt. So it's not a reference to short, short people who happen to be dark. It's actually about um, the, the, um, the black dwarves of astronomy. And here they are uh, with their own citizen activism, as it were, trying to bring life back to what was, um, what was uh, Mumbai. There are very important themes in this book, which I think make it particularly relevant as a track for our times, um, because this monstrous, technically powered, theoretically perfect futuristic dome um, seems to be, in some ways, the kind of ideal world that people talk about, fulfilling everyone's needs, enforcing equality, simulating happiness, but of course, at the same time, the problems it creates are spelled out uh, in the novel. Um, and, and there are a number of important themes in the book. Uh, does the economic development successes of a leader uh, make up for his past sins? Um, 
does um, a single vote matter? Can a single election create consequences that last for generations? <coughs> what was the magic about India that is now dying out? Uh, how do protests work? Uh, can they be usurped or appropriated? Um, for example, in the book, a lower caste protest is taken over by, quote unquote, the mainstream. How does that work? Can ideals be imposed? <coughs> Can uniformity serve to achieve these ideas? In other words, life can be programmed for equality, but do people really become equal? <coughs> and one could argue that these themes resonate uncannily in the India of 2020. The book is set in a distant future, but there is no question that the present is containing the seeds of the very questions and themes that we have uh, just talked about. In many ways, fiction is like, I don't know uh, whether many of you used to see those beer commercials in the misbegotten 80s for a particular beer that said it reached parts that other beers don't reach. Well, fiction reaches parts that nonfiction doesn't reach. Because with nonfiction, you approach the reader's mind, you argue, you persuade, you describe, but with fiction, you tell a story, and then through the story, you reach the reader's heart and not just his or her mind. And, and therefore, as readers of this kind of uh, dystopian vision, we have an invitation from the author, really, to decide whether we should be witnesses to the making, the unspooling of all the forces that will create this kind of India, or whether we, instead of merely being bystanders uh, to the events of history, have not the democratic obligation to be participants as well. Uh, there's a lot of magic realism in the book. Garcia Marquez has already demonstrated that that's a great way to get through to, uh, to people where you actually use flights of imagination to go well beyond the, the, um, the basics, as it were, of, uh, uh, of the facts and the details that you're trying to describe. And at the same time, uh, it's something which uh, is a challenge to writers of today, it seems to me. Our country is going through, a, in many ways, a terrible crisis of identity, of self-identification, of a sense of purpose. Uh, we're looking back on the one hand and reinventing and rewriting history. And on the other hand, we are, we are attempting to determine our own futures. And at this time, surely, the challenge that Varun Thomas Matthew has risen to, the challenge of actually looking at the present, describing it through the imaginative and creative lens that a creative writer can bring to the subject, and then through books, and one can say through songs, through poetry, through paintings as well, but certainly through books and the literary festival, uh, challenge what's going on and force us to think and think anew about all of this. Varun has actually been a campaign manager um, uh, in the last elections. He's running a technology, law, public policy, and human rights practice. So he's somebody who in many ways knows whereof he speaks. But he's written a book which, um, though I haven't yet read, in every respect, everything I've read about it makes it seem to me as a tremendously relevant book for our times. And in launching it today, I really want to wish him success, both for the book itself and in igniting conversations and perhaps new writings that will make this a, a, uh, an impactful work uh, in our times. Once again, good luck to the Black Dwarves of Good Little Bay by Warren Thomas Matthew. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon. The trouble with coming after Dr. Tharoor is that all, one's questions all become irrelevant. Uh -oh. He says all the important things. I'm so sorry. You can say them better. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I said I can say them better. So um, you mentioned Marquez, and that is where I wanted to begin too. 
In his Nobel acceptance lecture, Marquez said very movingly, he cataloged the disasters, the, the terrible violence that had happened in Latin America, and how a regular narrative could not do justice to it. And therefore, magic realism. That, that complex situation, I suppose, is upon us in India. And therefore, the need for a very, very different way of telling the story of India today, which you've done, you've taken up, Matthew. And Varun, I also wanted Dr. Tharoor, you to chip in, because when you were writing the great Indian novel, you did something like that. The yeah, well, I'd love to hear Varun uh, on this. I, I should mention to the audience, I apologize, I have to go off and get ready for my own session, so I'll only be staying for about 10 minutes. But uh, the two of them will engage with you in, in the conversation about Varun's book. And Varun, I think Vipri has asked you a question that sure. you sure. are best positioned to answer. Did you feel that other meth methods of uh, approaching this idea, um, you know, you could have written a non-fiction book, you know, like Future exactly. Shock or exactly. something. Uh, were they were inadequate to the story you wanted to tell or the warnings you wanted to issue? Right. Uh, the thing is, I think that fiction is a lot easier in terms of getting through to people. Uh, non-fiction, well, it's, it's an amazing form and I owe a lot to it. Um, it's often judged. Uh, it brings out biases even before it's read. And uh, fiction gives you a certain amount of liberty. I also feel that fiction lasts a lot longer. Right. And uh, there's a point that Devpriya brought up about Marquez. And, and uh, in fact, w Marquez's speech at the Nobel Prize was titled The Solitude of Latin America. Right. And there was so much about Latin America that had just escaped the history books, it had escaped popular imagination. And to some extent, I do think that there's a solitude about India right now in the sense that uh, while, of course, civil society, all of the people here are doing wonderful things in terms of documenting what's going on, uh, I think that there is a certain erasure of history that's happening at the very top. And uh, that way, I think fiction's a good way of capturing something that would just remain, you know, a little nugget in time and maybe 20 years later, people will remember what these times were like. Right. Uh, before Dr. Tharoor runs away, a question for both of them. Uh, this, these are testing times for the Indian democracy, for Indian politics. Now, Varun, your book is a dark book, but it's also, as would be in the case of a young writer, luminous with idealism. And that's what really spoke to me. What I want to ask both of you is that, is it possible to be idealistic in Indian politics still? If you don't have ideals, you shouldn't be in politics, in my view, but that's a personal view. I'm not sure how many of my fellow politicians necessarily subscribe to it. But uh, honestly, uh, for me, the only imperative to be in politics, which consumes most of my life and keeps me away from my own writing, is that you feel you can make a difference and a difference to more millions of people than you can just being a good human being in your own environment and perhaps helping a handful. And so the, the argument with... Um, with, with political life is in a democracy, politics is the best and possibly the only feasible way of making a difference. That's, that's ultimately what, what, I'm, what I'm interested in. Uh, and if you don't have ideals, then why, what is your motivation to make a difference? So for me, ideals are important. But is it easy to pursue ideals in politics? No. Is idealism present everywhere? No. Are ideals often fulfilled? No, because politics is often the art of compromise. It's an art of of how do you reconcile your ideals with somebody else's objections or indeed somebody else's counter ideals and still come up with something that can make things work. Um, governance, and, and it's particularly difficult to say now because we're in opposition for some time, but when we were in government, we realized a lot of governance is between a bad choice and a worse choice and deciding which is which. It's not that um, everything is just perfect and ideal and, and you know, it's one ideal or a lesser ideal. No, it's very often that you feel, for example, that um, um, there's something you want to get done, um, but the forces that are entrenched in resistance to it uh, are often far too powerful, uh, even if your position is transcendent. I mean, a recent example in my own political career was my attempts to, um, to decriminalize uh, homosexual relations, uh, which I thought, in any case, the government had no business being in people's bedrooms, or their kitchens for that matter. But when I tried to push it, uh, for the first time we had a bill that was not even allowed to be introduced, not once but twice, 
by the vociferous hostility of the opposition, of the, of the ruling party, the BJP. Until finally I said to those agencies that had come to me, you better go to the court. The only hope is the Supreme Court because they're not susceptible to what politicians think their voters want. See, I was pretty sure that I wasn't going to lose an election over this. But clearly, very many people felt that opposing this is what their constituents wanted them to do. And this is where the whole question of democracy and how many ideals you can fulfill within democracy shows itself in stark relief. Right. Varun? So, uh, I have a very micro view of this. Uh, I managed a campaign during the 2019 elections. And, and the one thing I saw on the ground was that you can't really be idealistic, at least in terms of the methods you use. And, um, I mean, the, the, the parties that we were ranged against, they, they do little things like, uh, you know, if, if you wanted to hold a rally somewhere, they'd book out every spot in the city. And uh, if they, they put up candidates with exactly the same name as your candidate. And you saw what happened in Delhi recently. And so there are a lot of these little minute things that, I guess they're tricks of the trade. And uh, to that extent, yeah, a little bit of your idealism, I think, might be shelved when you're uh, on the trail, at least. Varun, do you want to tell us how you came to write this book? Because I believe that every novel has a shadow novel that accompanies it, which is the, the, the story of how that book came to be. Uh, so, the thing is, around about 2014, a lot of the conversations that I was having with my peers, uh, with colleagues, I'm a lawyer, so uh, people in court, etc., was about uh, the new government. And a lot of people said that no matter what happened in the past, um, economic development or current good deeds are penance for it, they compensate for it. So, if you build a thousand roads, I mean, that's compensation for a riot. It doesn't matter. And, and that question was extremely troubling. Uh, it was, uh, I mean, does economic development really wipe out what you've done in the past? And it was, it was based on that that I began to think of writing about an election that could potentially change the entire history of a country or the entire direction of a country. And the idea for the Bombardrome was, uh, I mean, we, we do live in a society that forgets, right? And I just Im imagined a place where people have no memory of their past, which frankly is, uh, it, it is the case in India in many places. And uh, that was where the Bombardrome came about. And my time to go by Q. Hmm? So the conversation's going well. I'd be very happy to leave Deva Priya and Varun to it. Just want to say once again, I think that if you look at a book like this as an opportunity to think about trends in the present by reading a dystopian novel about the future, I think you're on to the right thing. Because the whole idea of books like this is to make us rethink our most familiar assumptions, precisely because of the improbability in today's world, as we imagine, of such a world as he describes. Is it that improbable? Are there trends and currents he's seeing, as a good perceptive writer should, that we have not seen, but which Maybe what's going wrong today carried to a logical extreme. That's the question. I'll leave it with you both, and good luck, uh, Varun, and uh, all Thank the best, so Devapriya. See you all. Thanks. My own session is at 2.30 in the front lawns. After this one, you're welcome to stroll over. You know, there's a character in this book called Saad. And Saad's strange bizarre talent is that the stories Saad writes come to pass, right? So he is the protagonist uh, narrator, Godse's friend, childhood friend. And when I was reading the book, and after that when I came and met Varun, I told him, you know what? You're Saad. And the reason is that when I was reading this book, protests were happening all across the country, and Varun's descriptions are so prescient when you when you wrote the book when it went to press that it was it was kind of surreal, right? Do you want to tell us a little bit about about Saad? Right. Uh, so the thing about Saad is he was a pretty difficult character to write. Uh, 
I wanted to show, uh, at least he's a character who portrays a certain justification for anger. I mean, he's, uh, he's a Muslim, young Muslim man. And he's a very he's, angry young man prototype. He is, right? yes. And uh, he's also gay. And uh, the thing is, the way our society treats certain people, I mean, certain people in the sense, the way it uh, handles certain people, it gives them a right to be angry. And um, Saad is a character who explores how uh, that anger can manifest. He's also, uh, because he's sensitive and in many ways, uh, he's able to tell the future. And I, he was a, uh, in a device that I could use to bring in some of the magical realism parts. Because for instance, he's able to see the future. And uh, he, right at the end of the book, he uh, for, foresees his own death. So he's a journalist, and he foresees his own death. It's actually uh, kind of a uh, homage to Lasanta Vikramatunga, uh, the great Sri Lankan uh, journalist who wrote The Sunday Leader. And he was the editor of The Sunday Leader, and he was shot dead. And the week before he died, he wrote uh, an article where he predicted his own death at the hands of the government. And uh, maybe I'll just... Yes, I was going to say that. Do you want to read a little bit? So, the, so the thing is, uh, what I've done with the book is, in each after each chapter, there's a little exhibit because it's being told from the future, and, uh, and also because you're a lawyer. Right, that's true. Uh, I have to back up what I say with exhibits all the time. So, this is the uh, exhibit that he wrote. It's a letter that he's writing to people, to all you who vote tomorrow. While I was at university, I attended a lecture by a journalist who told us, no profession calls upon its practitioners to lay down their lives for their art, save the armed forces, and journalism. He died not long after my class, made a martyr for refusing to leave a truth buried. It is against that standard that I have tried to weigh each step I have taken in this profession. And I must admit that I have almost, almost always failed. There have been no great truths that I have revealed to my audience, no great awakening that I have inspired, no significant change that my writings have wrought. Yes, my writings have been infused with my hatred for everything and everyone around me. But pause before you judge me harshly. After all, I am a homosexual Muslim man in India, and until recently, I was an active member of the Black Dwarves movement. So if I bear you ill will, I have some justification to offer. But now at this moment, I am but a few hours away from my death, and I find that all hatred that once possessed me has now left, and so I wish to do you one final service, a proper discharge of my duties. I wish to read the writing on the wall for you. There was once an idea of, of India, a beautiful dream never encountered before in history, that here, on this land, that had treasures to outlast millennia of plunder, would mankind create a nation so strong and magnificent that all men could lay claim to its citizenship. That possibility is now about to die forever. I cannot fully explain how I know this. Stranger things have happened in this country. So I take it that you shall not be unduly incredulous when I tell you that standing here on the brink of death, I am able to see numerous possible futures. And this is how I see your tomorrow. I see an India where the lives of cows are prized above the lives of men, and communities are lynched in broad daylight. I see an India that is singular with one religion and one ruler, and no constitution. All diversity cleansed, cleansed from our lands, and a single song sung repeatedly each day in unison. And it, it goes on like that, and, and finally he says that uh, I also see in India where you have this technological drome, like this massive monstrosity, where people can live. And frankly, I find that preferable to all of the other Indias I've listed out for you. And so that brings me to the question, Varun, that Thank you. the Bombadrome, it's a monstrous but fascinating place, right? And uh, the narrator, Convent Godse, there's a very interesting story behind his name. Uh, he has a, he rejects the Bombadrome. He is one of those few outliers who live, who choose to live outside it. Everybody else has surrendered to, to sort of the hypnotic quality of the Bombadrome. But what I find very interesting is that while your narrator rejects the Bombadrome, 
the author, uh, reveals a mixed response to it, right? You betray a little bit of desire also yeah. for that. So, so will you tell us a little bit about this? So uh, the thing is, uh, the idea for the Bombardrom came up when uh, the slogan Nache Din was coined. Uh, frankly, uh, I just got down to wondering what that would look like. What would in India, where our constitutional ideals are enforced, what would it possibly look like? And frankly, the only way that could potentially be achieved is through something like a benevolent dictatorship. And to some extent, uh, I think it may not be all that bad depending on where you're staying or, or who you are. So for instance, the Bombardrom is this place where they medicate the air, they make you happy, they, uh, the, um, so There's for instance- Prozac in the air. Exactly. And uh, one of the things they do is all the water is recycled. So frankly, the question that arises then is how can a caste system really exist when the Dalit and the Brahmin are consuming each other's recycled fluids? And in a way, uh, the Bombardrome, depending on who you are, it could be a place that you'd like to live. In fact, so it's set in Bombay. It's in a Bombay that's been ravaged by uh, and no climate rains. change and no right. rains. The rains have stopped there. And uh, there's an allegory to that. But uh, this is a city which is revolving above the uh, barren land of Bombay. And one of the ways they enforce equality is that all the houses keep rotating. So for one day in the year, everybody gets a sea view. And uh, people who live in Bombay, I mean, you know how precious that is, right? So uh, frankly, I wouldn't mind living in the Bombardrome at least for a while. But eventually, you lose all agency and you lose all Absolutely. sense of history. And also, uh, it's kind of artificial. So something I found very interesting is when you go to pray somewhere, uh, your religion doesn't matter because around you, you only see people you want to see. Right. So basically, if you are a very bigoted person, then you, will, you have cleansed all the others from right, your right. environment. So as you know, Bombay has no space. And in the Bombardrom, there isn't much space either. So what they do is, they, uh, they, they, all places of worship actually take place in the same location. Except that if you're Christian, you, through uh, virtual reality, you see a cross. And if you're a Hindu, you see your idol. And it's all tuned to you. So, uh, I mean, um, I think Black Mirror helped, if you've seen Black Mirror. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I think we're, we might have to start doing that soon. You. So, uh, I wanted to talk about your, your anti-hero. So, there's this powerful political leader who emerges. And he is, he's, eight, he's six and a half feet tall, or he's seven feet tall. Right. He's, he's, he's literally towering. And he is the one around whom the, the, the main question of the book, that what is worth sacrificing in order to build a better future? Do the ends justify the means? And he is somebody who believes, believes that. But he is also not a villain at all, right? right? You, you, you give him a very complex uh, personality. What, what was li that like? Was that hard? Well, um, the, the truth is that I don't think there are any real villains in politics right now. I mean, every leader is elected from a pool of 15 lakh uh, voters. And so it, it, at some level, there's always some side of that person who appeals to someone. Uh, the thing about uh, Alas, so the, the character's name is Alas. In fact, one of the themes in the book is the absurdity of the way uh, Indians name things. And um, his name is uh, Ankur Lal Shinde, so that's Alas. And uh, the thing about him is he is someone who just decides that you can only build a new world if you burn down what exists. And you remove all traces of memory of what existed. Because people are easier to control when they don't have a sense of their history. Or you can invent history for them. And so he sort of big brothers it. And in, in some ways, I mean, you'd, you'd think... Um, I mean, given how I mean, significant the problems are in our country, you often wonder what would a good benevolent dictator be like? I mean, could you uh, have a mix of maybe an Ambedkar and a Patel and, and a Nehru and all of these great people, you mix them up, can you actually make a great benevolent dictator? And so uh, I, I want to infuse yeah. him with these shades of grey and not black and white. Right. Um, before we open it up to the audience, one, one last question. Uh, the narrator, Convent Godse, is the last IAS officer left in the country, right? And uh, Ankur Lal Shinde 
has decided that if he becomes prime minister, which is the big vote that the book is leading up to, he's going to abolish the Indian administrative services. It's very interesting. You have a kind of an ambiguous relationship to the bureau. You critique the bureaucracy a lot, and yet, when uh, when Alas talks about abolishing it, one feels that oh, then are the witnesses of this going to go forever? Is the erasure going to be complete? Right. Right. So. Uh, I, I've seen a fair amount of civil servants in, in my time, and, and of course, I mean, uh, they've been called the iron pillar of India, uh, or the steel frame that holds it together, sorry. And, and the thing about uh, civil servants at the end of the day, I mean, uh, a, a, a great inspiration for this, of course, was Yesminster, where uh, in Yesminster, I mean, they poke a lot of fun at the civil servants there, and they say that... Uh, the civil servants are eternal. I mean, we endure. Governments might come and go, but, but we remain. And the thing is, when you are a civil servant and you're under, say, a politician who changes every few years, there's a certain amount of, uh, there's a limit to what you can really achieve under them. And at the end of the day, policies, you implement them, but you don't often create them. And so you are just a a witness to Indian history passing you by. I mean, these are people who've seen things, and that's their fundamental function. And that's something that, alas, in the book, he realizes. So the book is set in the future, and then the la and uh, alas is now ruling in pretty much every state. His party is spread everywhere, and he decides... There are these domes being built everywhere? Everywhere. Domes are being built in every city. And he decides to shut down the civil services because he doesn't want people remembering history. And there's just one civil servant now who remembers, and his name is Convent Godse. Um, uh, there's a funny story about how he got his name. And We uh, only have six minutes, so should yes. we open it up to the audience? Please. Do we have questions? Yes. And wh while the mic gets to him, you must go and buy a copy of this book. It's available here, and Varun is going to go and sign some copies. Yes. Thank you. Hi, my name is Yage, and I think there's an underlying paradox with every utopian world that every utopia is a dystopia. People get saturated after a while, there's no conflict left. So, I'm, so my question is, is it really necessary to have an utopian world? And if we have that, how do we save it from becoming a dystopian one? That's, that's an excellent question. Uh, the thing is, I, I do think that we need to have a utopian ideal that we can reach towards. But, but you're absolutely right. Uh, I mean, it's, it's always going to fall apart at some, at some point. Uh, in fact, if you look at like two of the greatest uh, dystopian novels of our times, not our times, but all time, uh, George Orwell's 1984 and Aldous Huxley's A Brave New World, uh, it's a very beautiful contrast that he creates, right? Uh, Orwell creates this dark gray controlled world, and uh, Huxley creates this wonderful, amazing, pleasure-filled world. And you find that both of them are probably going to last. Uh, of course, Aldous Huxley's might last a little longer because people are supposedly happy. And uh, yeah, it depends on exactly how you view your utopia, but uh, I think we need to be able to reach towards an ideal, so. And what he said, I think creativity and conflict have a deep link, right? And with the end of creativity, with the end of imagination, which, which a place like this will engender, is where... True. Absolutely. Another question somewhere? Right at the back. Hello. Hello, sir. My name is Jatin Negi and I'm coming from Shimla. So, uh, I do believe that if we want to change, like people are getting away from their roots, and I believe moral education can only bring us a living and spiritual education can bring the change in society as well as nation. So, what I want to say is, can you elaborate the kind of much more and how we can improve the democracy and the condition of a nation and the people who are doing all the kind of stuff and they can help. Thank you. Thanks. I, I think I'm the wrong person to answer this. You know, I'm a lawyer uh, and we revel in problems. But uh, in terms of uh, education and, yeah, I mean, of course, education helps tremendously. Religion, for instance, uh, and, and digressing a bit from the book, but uh, I think that 
the problem with India today is that we have very conflicting views of what being secular means. And uh, there's a certain amount of disrespect that's being given to a lot of religions. Uh, you find that even in the protests, for instance, when people uh, say they talk about uh, or they express their religion, it's being criticized. Which is why the entire affairs controversy right. happened, right? right. Exactly. And um, I think that such realization only gets born after great times of strife. And hopefully, the kind of protest that we're going through now, it is going to lead to a new consciousness uh, where people will realize that it's, it's better. And they'll, 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 this phase is going to be education itself. I hope that answered the question. Thanks. We, are there any other questions? Yes. You have used three times or more than three times the word benevolent dictatorship. Okay. I would uh, submit that uh, a person born in Hindu religion by virtue of uh, Hindu religion being highly pluralistic, he cannot even if he desires uh, to be a person nearer to dictator, firstly. Secondly, the conflict and the play of forces which are working in the modern world can be expressed by simple two words which represent Western Islamic civilization and uh, Hindu civilization. And these two words are ego adjustment which represent uh, Western civilization and uh, Islamic civilization and ego transformation, which uh, 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 addresses uh, Hindu system of uh, upbringing. So you are Thank right you. that uh, you, you said that a new sort of consciousness is developing. But to appreciate that new short of consciousness is, uh, I am afraid, not uh, a child's play. Sure. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. You know, so the, 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 the thing I, uh, the, when I mentioned a benevolent dictatorship, um, as a lawyer, and, and I've practiced for a while now, I've seen some things that are pretty awful. Uh, to give you an example, just, just pick out the Prevention of Atrocities Act. I mean, it's an act that is intended to prevent atrocities against marginalized classes in India. In the act itself, there is a detailed description of actions against the uh, scheduled castes, for instance, that are prohibited. And then these include things like, you shall not deny them water. You shall not deny them access to a well in a village. And the fact is, we know that this is going on. Our, our parliamentarians have debated this, and they've put it into law. Uh, and that's shocking because the law is so specific. You know exactly how you discriminate against these people. And it's there in the law. You know this, but you don't do anything about it. And so tomorrow, if we do have a benevolent dictatorship, I mean, and I, I mean. And, and just to, so that it, it is not uh, oversimplifying the book. The book takes a very complex uh, critique of benevolent dictatorship. It's not like he's recommending it. Oh, not right? at all. Not at all. In fact, Convent Goetze is the one character who's standing up against it, right? Questioning it, resisting it, even even when resistance seems impossible. So, so, so n not to uh, diminish the book, right? Yeah, not at all. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't recommend that. I don't think we should have a dictator. Remember that for the next election, and. Uh, <laughs> Indeed, uh, and the, the pluralistic part of, of uh, our, our heritage, right? Thank you very much. We are out of time, but you've been a wonderful audience, and hopefully you will go buy the book where he is. And you can, if you have further follow-up questions, maybe you can ask Varun at the bookshop, thank right? You so thank you. Thank you. Thank we you wish so much. To we wish to thank Warren Thomas and Dev Priya Roy for this very enriching and gripping session. Kindly note that the authors will be available to sign their books at the book signing desk. It's right in front of, uh, you know, right at the entrance of Charbagh. And uh, Varun, I believe, will be available for interaction there as well. The books are available at the bookstore. Please help us in keeping the venue clean and dispose any waste items in the bins placed all across the Yi Palace. 
The festival brochure and flyer with full program are available for purchase at the JCB Prize for Literature Bookshop, managed by Full Circle. You can also grab a copy of your favorite book while you're there. Do book tickets for the music stage. That's tonight at 6.30 on, sorry, it's at Clark Swamy, 6.30 onwards. The next session at Char Bag is session number 60, Asia Rising. It'll begin shortly. We request the audience to kindly occupy the front rows first. There are quite a few vacant chairs that I can see that can be filled up. Thank you.